struggling to move your nonprofit forward? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Nonprofit Architect, where we are giving you the actionable steps you need to launch and grow your nonprofit organization. Now, here's your host, Travis Johnson. Hey, welcome to the show. I'm sitting here today with Steve Sims, the author of Blue Fishing. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. You've done all sorts of amazing things. I love the idea behind blue fishing and love the speak easy life that you create. Uh, really do some amazing thing with events. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. But give us a little bit of a background. I know you're a newly minted American citizen, even though you've been here for 20 stinking years. Uh, feel free to share anything about that. And, and let's kick this thing off. Wow. God, that was a, a short question with a big answer. I'm a, a, a lad from East London, you know, the, the rough end of East London. I left school at the age of 15 straight into a building site. Um, this was back in the 80s, so I didn't have social media and Instagram to show me how inadequate my life was. But I had a gut um, feeling that I wanted more. I didn't know what it was, but I wanted more. And I went out... Funny enough, not to create it, but to ask those people that had it why they had it. Because as a bricklayer, and you're military, so you know this, you, you get up when you're told to go. You get up at 4.30 in the morning. You can't go, oh, no, I want to lay it now. I'm not comparing being a bricklayer to the military. Don't yell at me about that yet. But at my age, I would get up at 4.30 in the morning, go home at 8.30 at night. I would have been rained on, crapped on, you know, beaten up. And I thought to myself, okay, well, I'm not upset about working hard, but I'm upset about not getting the reward, you know? So I went on a journey to ask people why they were successful and I was not. And I learned all of these lessons along the way. And along the way, I realized that for me to hold your engagement, for me to hold your attention, I've got to be bringing some value. So what do you want? And so I found a lot of people felt needed access into an award show. They wanted to hang out with a celebrity. They want Now, I was never into all of that, but I wanted to talk to you. I wanted to keep your engagement, so I did it. So my, as I joke, my Trojan horse was that I launched the world's leading experiential concierge firm, only worked for millionaires and billionaires. I didn't want to work for poor people because they don't pay for things. How do I know that? Because I'm poor and we don't pay for things. We know that. That's, so I knew what they were like because I was one of them. And I've sent people down to the Titanic. I've sent them up in space. I've had them doing drum lessons with Guns N' Roses. Guitar lessons with ZZ Top. I've had them on stage with their favorite rock band. I've had them walk on rolls on movies, walk in the red carpet and the white carpet of Sir Alan John's Oscar party. Forbes called me the real-life Wizard of Oz. But again, understand... While it was a fantastical, amazing life of doing some incredible experiences, I just wanted to know what made successful people tick. And that was my life. That's what I started doing. And then as you called it out, three years ago, I got asked to write a book. I got paid very, very well to write the book. And that's an important thing. If you're not paid to write a book, you write a book that can sell, okay? When you're paid to write the book, you get to write the book you want to write. There's a, there's a difference. So I thought to myself, I don't care if it sells. I'm, I'm, I'm positive my publishing app, uh, house wouldn't be happy with that statement. But I got to write the book I wanted to write. I wanted to tell the stories I wanted to tell. I wanted to call you out on your stupidity the way I wanted to, rather than having to go, well, I've got to be a bit politically correct here and I've got to cast a wider net to get these viewers and me to sit. That didn't matter to me. I'd already been paid. So the book came out three years ago, and now I literally train and teach and coach and speak to entrepreneurs and organizations on how to go for stupid, go for what they've never achieved, for what they're capable of, the power of communication, the power of dreaming. Um, I now teach that and to get entrepreneurs uncomfortable enough to do something different. 
you, you see, I love that. We we have similar backgrounds. I grew up in trailer parks and foster homes and did 36 moves before I graduated high school. I understand that life. I understand wanting something more. I understand what it's like to work your tail off and not get a payout. And then I messed up and joined the military. And now I get a, a standard check every, you know, two checks a month and I can't earn any overtime, which is fine. But uh, coming up on retirement and so interested in this world. And I know, you know, this is a nonprofit show and we're going to get to events and things, but you really have to switch that mindset and do and look at things differently. If you want to have a chance in this life, if you want to have a chance to build what you want to do, you've got to be able to design what you want, but you got to know that you can make the choice to make that happen. I just love what you've done, taking control of your life and making it the way that you want it to. So that's fantastic. You've been able to do that. Now I first got introduced to blue fishing uh, while I was overseas. I was over in the Middle East and Bahrain station there looking to start a show. And I talked to my friend, Trish Leto, and she's like, you have absolutely got to. Yeah, if you're not seeing this right now, Steve's chuckling because he knows exactly who Trish Leto is. She's like, you've, you've got to read this book. You've got to connect with Steve. And my big thing was listening to audiobooks as I'm riding my bike in the evenings, riding my bicycle around the, the kingdom of Bahrain. And most audiobooks, they hire a professional voice actor. They get something like that going. But I really love the books read by the author. You get that little bit extra spice, that little extra flavor, that little bit of extra emphasis. More than pleasantly surprised to hop on blue fishing and hear Steve Sims himself tell the story in his own words. But you get a little story surrounding that, don't you, Steve? Oh, hell yeah. I'm having a right little giggle on this. As I say, the book came out. And for anyone that doesn't understand the world of publishing, you sell the rights to your book to be translated into other countries, to be translated into a course. And we got uh, approached by Blackstone, which was one of the leading companies that sold audio books. And they contacted the publisher and they said, hey, we'd like to do Bluefish in audio book. So, you know, the publishing house go, hey, Steve, is this acceptable? Which is basically them being polite because they'd already signed the contract. You know, they they own the contract because they paid me so much at the beginning. So they were trying to be polite, and I was like, yeah, great, you know, go for And I didn't pay any attention to it. And I just thought, great, I'm going to be on an audio book. Meant, meant nothing to me. This was my first book, by the way. And then I get an email, and the email has got three links on it. And the email said that, and this is from the, uh, this is from the publishing house via my agent to me. So on this email, it said, We interviewed 18 voiceovers and we narrowed it down. And though these are the three that we feel would be best to read your book. So I'm thinking, and I know it sounds stupid, but I'm thinking, oh, I never, I never realized you had to read it. You know, I I never thought about it. So I played these three. Now they had picked that top three out of this like over a dozen people. Each one of them was an American person doing a British accent. And, and all I could think of was, these are the three you like. The others must have been atrocious. And I, now, bear in mind, again, this came from my agent. So I've got an old English bulldog as one of my dogs. So my agent and I are you know, a little bit more blunt with each other. So I typed back to him going, look, I've listened to all three, and I just want to point out that my old English bulldog's left testicle could do a better British accent than anyone here. But if I had to choose, and I don't know who I picked, number three or number two, I said I picked number whatever. And I sent this email back to my agent. So my agent, in all of his wisdom, just forwarded that directly to the publishing house and the publishing house emailed me direct going, we're unsure of the availability of your dog's left testicle, but would you be willing to, and you're like this, would you be willing to audition to do your book? So because the contract had been sold out, we, they had to have the approval. So I literally went along, and there were two other people there and I, they, one of them did an audition and they went, oh, so who are you? And I went, I'm Steve Sims. And this person turned around and said, that's funny because that's the same name as the guy that wrote the book. And I went, 
Well, what do you know? So I thought, well, that's the sharpest person I've met. And so I, I auditioned for my book. Big shock, horror surprise. I got the gig. I read, I read the book. But if anyone's ever done anything before, um, I had a pair of cargo pants on. And the, the, like the sound booth that you sit in when you're reading the book, it picks up on everything. And for anyone that can't see me at the moment, I've got a, a, a bracelet on and a watch. But any kind of jewelry clanking, any kind of rubbing of material, like when you cross your legs and I had the cargo pants, it could be picked up. So we had to call it quits, and I had to go home and change and come back to do this, just wear, like, fleece pants so that there was no scratching. But I'm in this booth, and there's no air conditioning flow through it because that would have been picked up on the thing. I've got fleece uh, jogging bottoms on. It was one of the worst experiences. Now, this was supposed to be recorded over four days. We pulled it off in two. And we went through on the second day with no breaks, no toilet breaks, no lunch break, no coffee. Because I knew that if I stepped outside for another break, I'm done. I'm gone. I'm not going to read this bloody thing any further. So, but I've been amazed at how many people don't read. I can understand why they don't, because it is horrible. But I was amazed at, A, the feedback I've got that I actually read my own book and how amazed so many people don't. So we are writing another book at the moment called Go For Stupid. I will read that, but I will really prepare myself before, you know, I go in and read it. Because it's for anyone that's thinking of doing a book, doing an audio book is tough. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. It sounds like Charlie Chaplin going to a Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest and coming in second. You had to audition to read your own book. That's fantastic. I love it. Now, you've done some work with some nonprofits, which is great. You've worked with incarcerated people at Defy. You've done uh, events with Elton John and his cause. What is the big thing, the big difference between a world-class event that you've held separate from nonprofits? And then what do you look at when you see the mediocre to terrible nonprofits event? You know, how can nonprofits really do that better? If I may be allowed, I'm going to rephrase the question that you asked me. A lot of people ask, What's the difference between a non-profit event and a for-profit event, okay? And the answer should be nothing. And this is where people get wrong. So if you nail it down as to what makes them different when they're bad, it's one of them creates value, creates engagement, creates something you want. The other one creates pity. Now, I will tell you the story um, of a horrendous event for an amazing cause. Um, I had been approached because I do a lot of marketing and branding through Sims Media, and I was approached to help, God, this was maybe eight years ago, I think, um, by Wounded Warrior. Okay? Great foundation. And the event was that they were going to have a party at the Playboy Mansion. And they said, what we're going to do is we're going to throw a party at the Playboy Mansion. And um, for every like third or fourth ticket sold, a member, uh, a wounded warrior is going to be allowed to come. And they said, you know, it'll show presence for the event. It'll, it'll raise awareness for the event. This will be a, a great thing to get. But people are going to want to come. It's the Playboy Mansion. And I said, don't do it. Terrible idea. It'll never work. And you know, I even lost the contract. They refused to work with me. I actually got removed from the project. And I said to them, you're missing a point. When people spend money, I'll be blunt and tell you that maybe 60% of the people there don't even know or don't even care about the charity. And as a charity provider, nor should you. You see, as a charity, as, as a nonprofit, You've got one concern when you do an event is to raise as much money as possible for as little outlay. That's your goal for you. That's your selfish goal. You want to get as much money and pay out as little in doing the event. That's your selfish goal. The goal you want for the attendee is that the event was so cool, they're going to want to come back again. Those, those are the two goals. Do not lead the lines. Now, 
the Playboy Mansion, when it was going, when it existed, any, you know, any man, any single guy would love to go and party at the Playboy Mansion. So you had, you had a draw, okay? Now, why does a guy go to the Playboy Mansion? It's not to look at fine art, is it? <laughs> no, no. Find something, yeah. Exactly. So you are at the Playboy Mansion to see what you expect when you go to that environment. Now, I'm going to be very blunt, but please, I beg, not disrespectful. When you've got a group of guys that have spent $2,000 per person to go to the Playboy Mansion and they're greeted with individuals that have limbs and parts missing because of that service, it's a disconnect. They're there for one thing, and they're being greeted by something. Else. How can you walk into a party that you're there for one reason? It's benefiting another reason, and quite simply is being pushed down your throat was it's hard for the guys to get drunk and to get photographs with the ladies when this is very clear to them. It created a bad emotion. It was one of the worst parties I'd ever heard of, okay? And the people that went there, I didn't go. The people that went there contacted me afterwards and they went, Steve, you're right. And I said, look, your goal was not that. I said, if you want that, rent the party over two nights and on one night have all the participants there and on the other night do but you're missing the point. Charitable events, you need to focus selfishly on the ticket price, what you can gain, and what you can sponsor out to reduce your costs. That's the first goal, okay? And in fairness, that's the only goal. The second goal is to do it. And I've been to some charity events, and I've walked up to people, and I've gone, so you enjoying the night? And they've gone, yeah, I'm having a great time. And I'm like, oh, that's fantastic, Travis. Hey, I, I believe this is a charity event. What charity is it supporting? And they've had no idea. Now, the trouble is, too many charities, they come with a bit of an ego, okay? Too many charities go, well, don't you realize I'm saving the butterflies? Don't you realize if it wasn't for me, the elks of, of, of Alaska wouldn't have a place to live? Now, your cause is great. And I'm not saying I don't care about your cause, but I am going to say that it is not my focus on this event. My focus on the event is to get you enough money to be able to do the good you're doing. Okay? Don't confuse the two. Shove your ego in your, in your bedroom drawer and leave it there. Focus on getting the money and focus on making sure that you put an event together that's so good, devoid. Now, I'm going to bring up Defy because you mentioned Defy. And this is a phenomenal group that I support a lot because it, it, it's near and dear to me. They made a major screw-up. That screw-up was that they would do an event, and at the end of the event, they would basically sit everyone down, give them the sob story, give them a donation form, and then give them 10 minutes to complete the donation form before everyone goes home. You always remember the beginning of a movie, and the end of a movie, okay? If the end of a movie is bad, how many times do you go, well, that was a bad movie? Every time. And in, yeah, but in truth, if you got to the end, probably two-thirds of the movie wasn't bad. It had you engaged. But the ending sucked so bad that you now brush stroke that entire movie as a bad movie. So your ending is always important. For the ending of the Defy event, for us to be, you know, kidnapped, held hostage for 10 minutes while we're given a sob story. Now, the event and experience that we had had, I had been able to look, maybe it's my marketing background, but I'd been able to look at that moment and go, this sucks. This is stupid, okay? And in fact, I went to the fire and I went, you're doing it wrong. Your experience is worth paying for. Don't beg for donations. Charge them for the experience. And that's what I did. And I've been working with Defy for about three years on that exact model. And that's what we do. We charge people to come and enjoy it. Okay. We charge people to get uncomfortable and we charge people to grow. Okay. We don't have to ask for donations now because we've been funded before they get on the bus. So you need to focus on what's in it for you. Shove your ego away. 
and then focus on how can you get these people coming back? How can you get those people uh, happy and enjoying? Because let's be serious. There's nothing looser than a credit card coming from a happy person. When they're smiling, they're like, yeah, take my credit card. I'll, I'll auction that. Yeah, I'll buy that. Yeah. When people are happy, they're a lot looser with that checkbook. So that should be the focus. Too many, too many for-profits and too many non-for-profits lead with the pity play. They lead with the sad news. They lead with the, oh, my God, it's a, that's a mood killer. There's no way in the world you want to bring a mood killer into an event. So focus on what the points are. When I'm when I speaking about my background and I could go in depth and talk about how terrible it was, I say it at that quick little wave tops format so you can understand and build a picture of who I am. And then I immediately roll into the transformation. I immediately roll into what I'm doing now or how different my life is. I could spend the whole stinking time that I'm talking to every time that I'm a guest. I could, you know, go into the details of, of that stuff, but that doesn't help anybody. That doesn't make anyone feel good. And they remember how you make them feel. When I talk to nonprofits, we do all sorts of different things. Talk to great people that do fundraisers, cool events. And I'm like, what's the coolest event that you've done? And if they have a hard time coming up with an answer, I'm like, what are you even doing in the industry? I talked to a guy. He was one of the Patrick Kirby. I always love giving him a shout out. Fantastic guy. He's one of those interviews where I thought it was going to be 30 or 40 minutes. And I just kept going and kept going and kept going. So much energy, so much value. I was like, what's the coolest event have you done? He was like, oh, hold on. It was an adult prom. It was for, I want to say it was for uh, people with Down syndrome. They brought people with Down syndrome there, but everyone had the gowns. They had the crazy tuxedos. They spiked the punch to start because it's a bunch of adult. They took the cheesy photos, but they had a big party. It was a total crazy event. It was so different from every other standard gala with rubber chicken. It was standard, you know, it was different than the uh, bringing up the pity party, the pity parade up front and say, these are all our problems. This is all about fun and impact. I'm like, these are the things that we're doing. This is the impact that we're making because there's one and a half million nonprofits out there. Someone's got the same mission as you. What kind of impact are you making? The thing that you're doing, why is it so much wow or so much better than someone else? Oh, you're telling me in a pamphlet? Come on, let's let's have a show of it. Let's have a good time. Let's have fun. And you can see the difference. You can see the difference in the people talking about it. You can see the difference in the checkbook. You can see a difference in the outcome. And I love, love, love having a great time when I go out. Who doesn't? Who wants to go out to be made miserable? Who wants to go out to be feeling sad? Who wants to get dressed up with your partner, go to a gala, and then cry? You know, it just doesn't make any sense. But that seems to be what a lot of these places and a lot of these foundations try to do. They think if I can make you cry, then you're going to support. No, if you make me cry, it's going to make me want to get as far away from you as I possibly can. So I stop crying. You think I'm going to come back your next year? Forget it. Because you made me cry the last year. No. Yeah, I'm, I'm on board. You got to get them there. You got to have fun and you got to beg them to come back next year. Say, hey, I know COVID is going on, but do we have a secret backdoor event I can go to and hang out with you? Because I had a great time doing it. And which, what you call it in your world is the speakeasy experience. I don't think nonprofits are familiar with the speakeasy. What's the speakeasy experience? Oh, dear. Um, so this was one of those things that just happened by it not happening. So I wanted to throw an event, and I knew I wanted billionaires in there. Again, move with purpose. Everything you do, move with purpose. Don't do anything by accident. So I wanted to have an event that just had, like, top-notch people. I run an event now called Sim Speakeasy, which is for entrepreneurs. And in the past, I used to throw private parties that were only for millionaires and billionaires. I, did, I do the same thing for both. I would first of all find out how many people want to come along. I'm not going to tell them where it is. I'm not going to tell them who's going to be there. I'm not going to tell them any of this. I'm just going to say it's going to be, you know, on this date in this city. Who wants to come? And I would get some people sign up. And I thought to myself, if I get 50 people sign up, now all I've got to do is look for a location that can house 50 people. If I get 10 people sign up, I only need a location that can house 10. I didn't want to take on a place that can house 100. 
and all of a sudden I'm at a liability. So I went in reverse. And then what I would do is I'd be like, oh, what's your favorite music? What kind of food? You-? And I would sculpt something that they wanted to go to. And so if you imagine, you know, your favorite nightclub, okay? Why was it your favorite nightclub? Oh, the, the, the style of ambiance was just incredible. Like the adult prom. Who doesn't want to go to an adult prom? That sounds brilliant. And I've only just become American. I would go to that. But you can imagine it's going to be all the music that you remember that triggers emotions and that you remember all the words of, you know? I'm 55 years old. So for me, I want to go to those retro parties. But just imagine if someone had scripted that or structured that with me originally by me having all of those questions answered. And that's what I did with the event. And then with the speakeasies, I would say to my entrepreneurs, what's your problem? What are you working on at the moment that you're having difficulty with? And they would tell me. So by going in reverse, I could actually structure something that people wanted. And then it became, this is so secretive. This is so, we don't know what's going on. And one of my clients one day turned around and said, this is like a speakeasy. You know, you know that's where all the stuff goes on, but you don't know what goes on unless you're in. And that's what happened. We actually end up physically launching speakeasies around the world um, when I was doing parties. And now I run them for entrepreneurs at simspeakeasy.com. And no one knows anything. They pay. They attend. We're all sold out already, so there's no pitching for anyone to go. Um, you can't go. Um, and people pay for no idea what's going to happen. They don't know who's going to be there. They don't know what they're going to learn. But every time someone pays, we say to them, Travis, thanks a lot for registering. What's your problem today? And we get to find out and we bring that in. So, again, I want to make money. Selfishly, I want to make money from an event, okay? I want to do these events because they help me grow. Like you have conversations with interesting people. This is my excuse to get interesting people in a room, okay? So I'm getting paid. And I'm increasing my network. That's what's in it for me. For it to remain a benefit to me, I've got to make it a benefit for you. So that's the way I work. That's the way I, I handle things. And they've done really, really well for three years now. You see, I love the concept of that. It, nonprofits listening to this right now, think about what Steve is saying and what he's trying to deliver to you. He's saying, create an experience that has value and engagement. Figure out what it is the people attending want and then give them what they want. Why wouldn't you give them what you want, right? Why wouldn't you give them what they want? You give them what they want, they're excited and they want more. Well, here's the daft thing. And you can do this with automation. And the, the, the way that I can get most of your listeners to turn off is to say, well, this is going to cost you. And then they go, oh, we don't want cost turn off. Okay. It doesn't take much building out software wise to have, in fact, it's already probably even in your CRMs that every time someone buys a ticket, an automated email will go to them with a survey on there going, which is your favorite food out of these five? What's your favorite genre of music? What design do you like most when you're going to a party? What do you like to wear? Now, if you ask those four questions and it just went out to the people, before you did anything, you'd be able to give them the food, the style, the music, and the outfits that they love. Who wouldn't want to go back to a party again the following year knowing that you put their requests first? I can't think of anyone that would say no. That's that's what you want. You want to go to a place where you walk in and you feel welcome the music is what you want. The ambience is what you want. They got food that doesn't suck and you're happy to be there. What, what, what better way to make them more comfortable? What way better way to have them more excited to be there and have a great time than to give them what they want. One of the biggest road bumps I get when talking to nonprofit organizations, like I really wanted them to do this. I was like, well, did you say that you wanted them to do that? Well, they should know. How many mind readers do you know? How many mind readers are in your audience? How many mind readers are following you on Facebook? Uh, Is your spouse a mind reader? Chances are they're not, right? Um, Did you tell them what you wanted to do? Did you tell them the best way that they can support you? I had a guy talk to me and he was like, (laughs) he got up on stage in front of people that he knows 
And he said, I'm mad at you people. I do all these things on social media. Ain't none of you sharing and no one's donating. And I said, hey, brother, did you tell them that you wanted them to share things on Facebook? And did you give them a call to action that you wanted them to donate as easy as three bucks a month or whatever the thing is? And he's like, I didn't. I was like, so you yelled at all these people that love and support you, but they just didn't know how you wanted to be loved and supported back. And you didn't tell them what you wanted and you didn't get what you wanted because you didn't tell them. You have to tell them what you want. I asked my wife, you got the five love languages, right? You've got this whole thing out there. And I said, what, how can I love you better? And she's like, I want to be touched more. She loves touched. So every time I walk by her, you know, hand across the bottom, a quick kiss, a little squeeze, just a little extra touch in her day makes her feel amazing and lets her know that I love her. But I asked her what she wanted. She told me what she wanted. And then I gave it to her. And somehow that makes me amazing. Today, you've just hit on something a little bit deep and dark. Today, we are getting really bad at communicating, okay? We're getting appalling at it. We need it more, and we're getting worse. We've just gone through COVID where we couldn't connect with people, and there's nobody out there going, oh, my God, I can't wait for COVID to be over so I can buy my new watch or I can buy my new car. All they want to do is to get together with our friends and family, okay? Well, I don't want to break it to you, but we started outsourcing our friendship 20 years ago when we invented Friendster and MySpace and Facebook and LinkedIn and A Small World and all the other countless programs. If you imagine in 1990, when you had a baby, you phoned your mates. You went around there. You showed them pictures, okay? Now what do we do? We have a baby, we stick a picture up on Facebook, and then we're pissed off if you don't like it or make a comment, okay? We've got really, really bad at truly connecting with an individual. Now, there's something worse. We're being trained to not connect. We're being trained by these people called Siri, Alexa, Amazon, Uber, where you bark a command and it's done. Alexa, turn the audio on. Siri, phone mum. Uber Eats, get me this. Uber, take me there. There's nothing disrespectful in any of that because we're being trained to commit to transactions. Amazon, deliver me toilet roll. Toilet roll's there. Great. How many of you out there have a relationship with Amazon? No one. There's no chat line. You can't phone them up and go, do you know I'm thinking of changing my toilet roll? Betty, which one would you pick? You know, there's no such number. So we're being educated, triggered, and formed habits on how to not have relationships while at the same time bitching and moaning that we don't have them while secretly we're the ones that have ruined it. Now, in this year, and I can say these words that will make everyone uncomfortable, I can sit there and I can just say, me too, Black Lives Matter, Asian hate politics, transgender. I can say all of these things, and one of those, if not more than one, will make the person go, oh, I hope no one starts a conversation on that. We're getting so bad at having conversations that the way to not have a conversation is to avoid the conversation. We need to be having more uncomfortable conversations. You have literally... Ask your wife, hey, babe, what do you want? I've had the same thing with my wife, so you're obviously a smart man there. I've done the same thing with my wife. I've said, look, how can I make you feel better? How can I make you feel confident? How can I make you love? I've had the same conversations you do. How easy, or let me rephrase this, how hard is it to get that wrong when they say, I like it when you stroke my neck when you walk past me? You know, I don't like it when you call me babe but I love it when you call me beauty, you know, whatever. When you're given that, we're men, okay? We got four brain cells and they don't all work together. Yeah, two of them don't work uh, half the time, so. (laughs) But if the other two have basic rules, because men, we're good with rules, okay? We're good with guidelines. So if I know, hey, don't call her this, but call her this, touch her hair, speak to her hair, do that, put the wash, fold the towels, she loves it. My wife hates filling the car up with gas. 
absolutely hates it. It's like I bought her a bunch of flowers when she jumps in the car. She will quite often either jump out of the car or text me on the way going, oh, thanks for filling the car up with gas. Hey, you're welcome. I'm like a damn rock star because I've simply done something that she wants to be done, okay? It may, it's not hard, okay? So today, we need to be having more conversations because the dumb thing that happens when we have conversations is that we become educated. Having a conversation with someone about Black Lives Matter makes you confident. Most people will run away. What if I say the wrong, what if I say the wrong thing? Well, let me help you out. You more than likely are going to, okay? Because I don't know what other people are going through. That's why I'm asking. I want to know what you're going through. I want to understand where this pain's coming from so I can be part of the solution and my ignorance doesn't add to being part of the problem. So today we need to have a conversation. And you're right. Most people out there will go, well, I'm not going to have a conversation because, well, they know what to do. We're a charity, so they know we need money. But when the last time, this is one thing I did, and it couldn't be any bloody easier. But last year, no, I think it may have even been the year before, I don't remember. But on my birthday, uh, it was last year because of COVID, I said, who would buy me a whiskey if they met me in the bar? It's my birthday on Thursday. Who would be that person? Loads of people went, I would, I would, I would. And so what I did was I got a menu of a local bar that I go to. And I said, well, as you know, I like an old fashioned. And this bar did them. And I think it was like 13 bucks or something like that, or $15, something stupid like this, for this old fashioned. I said, I want you to buy me an old fashioned for my birthday. And this is how you can do it. Click on the link below to the Defy Ventures charity and donate the price of an old fashioned. And then I did a Zoom call with all the people that had, and we had a Zoom hour of really appalling jokes, chatter, while all drinking an old-fashioned. But I don't, it only raised, I don't know, it was like 3,000, 4,000 bucks um, for Defy. But what effort was in it, you know? By simply just going, hey, would you, like Travis, if I said to you, Travis, would, if you met me in a bar, would you buy me a whiskey? Yeah, absolutely. I'll buy you whiskey, buy me a bourbon. There you go. So, so perfect. So if I turned around on my, my birthday and went, hey, we're not going to be together, but do me a favor. I want to support this charity. I know you support it as well. Buy me a bourbon there. and we'll do it. I made it interesting for you. You were still doing something for me, but you were helping out the charity. I wonder how many charities out there have ever tried to do something as simple and as stupid as that, because it doesn't take any intelligence and social does far better than emails and any of these other you know, campaigns that you put in the mail and stuff like that. But that's the simple stuff. No, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, direct mail, social and texting is where everyone is connecting. You're much, much, much more light, likely to respond to a text, open a piece of mail or chat with your favorite friend or your favorite group on Facebook or whatever social media you're on. It is, it is so good. I love that you brought up the uncomfortable conversations because they're my favorite ones because I assume, I assume that I don't know something. Like we have different opinions here. I'm assuming you, you got to your opinion through your life. I've got through my opinion through my life. You feel fervently against my opinion. Share with me. What am I missing? I can be, I can be swayed. I'm assuming there's something I don't know. And my opinions have changed over time because you get new experiences. You meet new people. You get new points of view. Like before I went overseas, before I went to the Middle East, I was terrified of going over there because the only thing I see, right, only bad news makes it over the ocean. And it's the same way the other way. You think they get good news out of America? Spoiler alert, they don't. They only get the terrible, terrible stuff. Um, but you go over there and you are shocked, at least I was, to discover there was people over there. I don't know if you know this. There are actually people. <laughs> they work. They care about their families. They care about their children. They want their kids to have a better life than they did. But some things are a little different. Some things are a little, little different and a little weird or probably a little weird the way we do them. But there's people over there. And as soon as I got over there and realized there's just people there like everywhere else, I flew out to Egypt, had a great time in Alexandria with a friend of mine that was getting married. I went up to Vienna Met another friend of mine, Stephen Kuhn, up there. We hung out with his place in Budapest for the rest of the week. Went to Dubai. Took the family out to Dubai. Had a great time. Shocking. 
Christmas in Bahrain, they decorate like we decorate in the U.S. They've got up the Santa's house. They've got the elves. They sing Christmas carols, even though their vast majority is straight Christian. And they have a Santa Claus in a red hat and suit. It is great. I love, love, love the fact that there's people all over this universe, all over the world. And if we talk to and treat each other like we're people, like we're family, everything just goes a lot better. Just assume the best out of people. If you have a question on a sensitive topic, be like, I don't feel the same way as you do. And I'm assuming it's something I don't know. Would you please share with me your experience and I can get a better point of view on what this thing is because I don't understand it. And then understand that everyone just has an opinion and it's okay if they have the same opinion, you have the same opinion when you part ways. I love people that try to argue with me. Eventually I'll just say, you're right. They'll stop arguing and they'll leave. And someone's like, well, why'd you do that? You don't feel that way. It's like, I'm okay with them being wrong. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's the, the uh, you're right. The, you're right is the the quietest slap in the face ever. You know, when you go, yeah, yeah, you're right. It's just, it's, if I've ever got that to me, I'm like, whoa, where did we lose the conversation? And you try to get it back. But um, yeah, it's a, sometimes you do get that, but you've got to challenge yourself. I remember on a, on a podcast, someone said to me, and I never rehearse podcast questions. People send me, Questions. You, I don't think you did, but I never read them uh, because I never want to come up with a pre-scripted answer. And someone said to me, "If you could have dinner with anyone in the in the world, you know, dead or alive, uh, who would it be?" And um, I said, "Definitely Hitler. alive. Definitely alive yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah for, the, for the dead wouldn't be very entertaining." But I said to him, "I said anyone that I could have dinner with, I said I'd like to have a conversation with Hitler." And they were like, "Oh, why do you want to do that?" And I said. I want to understand why someone that was short and brown haired was fighting the world to create a master race of tall and blonde that would eventually realize he's not one of them and kill him. So what was going on there? You know, and I wanted to ask him quite directly, what were you so scared of that made you do what you did? And I'd like, I'd, honestly, I wouldn't agree with, no one can agree with what he did. But I want to know where it came from. It's it's amazing when we search for that understanding that we actually have a chance to find that common ground. Uh, Before we get wrapped up here, I wanted to ask you a question that uh, I said, hey, I'm interviewing Steve Sims. Like, what do you guys want to know? Uh, The question that was posed to me by Judy Skilling was, which experience that you created had the most impact on you personally? So I have done experiences that have been in the millions of dollars for one night. You know, I've closed down museums for a dinner party and then had, for six people, and then had Andrea Bocelli come in and serenade them while they're eating their pasta. So I've done some show-off, big, over-the-top events. The most impactful one I ever did was the cheapest one I ever did. Um, I had been working with a client in Chicago, and every anniversary we had done something for him. And the cheapest anniversary date we did I think it was like 50 grand. The most expensive was, I think, 600 and something thousand dollars for a weekend. Um, so I'm used to spending rich people's money. And he contacted me one year. We did this over like eight years. And then one year he contacted me and he went, Steve, anniversary coming up. And I went, oh, so what we're going to do? And we had, we had closed down restaurants. We had closed down uh, stadiums. We had done private jet flights. We had helicoptered into the Grand Canyon for a dinner party at the the base of it. You know, we've done all of this over-the-top, extravagant champagne diamonds, all that kind of stuff. And he said to me, this is my 20th. He said, this one needs to be impactful. That changed everything. So what we did was I said to him, I said, tell me how you first met. And I found out how they first met. And he had tried going out with her, getting her on a date, God, 10 times. And she had like blocked him on every single one. No, thank you. No, go away. You're an idiot. No, go away. And then one day, at college, he got the picnic rug and he got a boom box with like cheesy love tunes on there. And he got a bottle of champagne and he got You've a wicker listening to the sandwich basket architect and to sat to outside the classroom shows, that she was in, colon, waiting for her to come out of the classroom in a packed college. And be sure to subscribe, of the, rate, of the and grass, review our show. Outside her Thank classroom, you. he hits the play button for these cheesy songs. He uncracks a bottle of champagne 
and pours it into a little cheap plastic uh, um, champagne glass and says, care to join me? He made such an idiot of himself in front of everyone during break that she went and sat next to him, you know, and it started from there. So what we did was we actually sent her off in a limousine. Now, she'd been used to all of these amazing weekends. They were very affluent now, uh, very high profile. And she went for out for about 40 minutes, and then she turns up at this park. And in the middle of the park, we had, had reenacted the first time he met. We had the boom box that we had found pictures of from when he was at college, that we sourced that model of boom box. We'd seen pictures of him with his parents when he was a little baby to see what that picnic rug looked like. We even got plastic champagne glasses to reenact you know, the champagne bit. And they opened up the door of the limousine and she stepped out and he leant back and clicked the play button. And it was so impactful from the first moment they ever met that she actually fell on her knees and started crying. Now, she had had half a million bucks spent on her in a weekend just to say happy anniversary. This one cost, it was less than $2,000. And the reason it cost as much as it did was because we had to buy three boom boxes because two of them were broke. Otherwise, we'd have been down less than $1,000 for this experience. Most impactful moment of my life. And it was so, he showed he cared more than he, than he paid, you know? It was all about the moment, all about the thought, all about the impact, all about the emotion, all about the triggers. It was just powerful through and through. That's fantastic. They hit you right in the feels. I don't care who you are, that has an impact. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for coming on and dropping just amazing value. Thank you for saying yes to my request to come on a nonprofit show. Uh, endless value here today. Where can folks get a hold of you if they want to know more about you, blue fishing, the speakeasy? Where can people find you? So I'm at stevedsims.com. That's easy enough. There's only one M in Sims, stevedsims.com. If you want to join my community, I've got one that I actually converse with people a lot called Sims Distillery. That's my private inner circle. But if you want to sniff and find out what I'm about, then you can join the free Facebook group, An Entrepreneur's Advantage with Steve Sims. I'm on Instagram, uh, Twitter, everywhere under Steve D. Sims, 1M. 